Hey folks, Wine Dude here in beautiful Santa Barbara, here in the Funk Zone. I was cruising down the street and I looked up and I saw this sign, Marjoram Wine Company. I just happened to run into Doug Marjoram at the donut store. Don't tell anybody. And he told me to come on in and just do a little interview with him. Great guy, great place, great wines. So join me as we go inside and explore Marjoram Wine Company. So guys, I'm the wine dude and I'm here at Marjoram Wines and this is the Doug Marjoram. <laughs> Doug. Yes. How's it going? Good. It's a beautiful sunny day after all this rain, right? Um, he's the owner of Marjoram Wines. Uh, he's got, uh, what, a couple tasting rooms? Uh, we have a tasting room here in Santa Barbara, where we are now, which is right across the street from the Hotel Californian. In the funk zone. In the funk zone. The not so funky zone, <laughs> but it's still funky. And then we're just opening up in Los Livos. We'll have a little tasting room up there, and but that'll be a couple months from now. Uh, we do not do tasting at the winery except for by appointment. We do these really cool little curated uh, tours and tastings at the winery, but you have to sign up for those and we need to know in advance. Well, that's great. I run wine tours, as you guys know, and we came here a couple weeks ago, and oh my God, the wines are awesome here, and people have such a great time. You even have ice cream, right? Yeah, we have our own proprietary ice cream made by the goddess of ice cream herself, Rory. She's 6'2", Irish redhead, is passionate about ice cream, and um, I had this Amaro ice cream recipe, and she, she made it, and she goes, I can make it better, and I'm like, you know, I've been making this for years, you know. She goes, no, no, I can make it better. And then right right at the end, she threw in a little bit of salt. Nice. And mixed it again, and it was better. So it's it's fabulous ice cream. We were happy to work with her, but it's only sold here. Right, Yeah. right. And based on your wine, correct? It's made with Amaro wine. Right. Amaro is a bitter after-dinner wine that's fortified and uh, has roots and herbs and barks in it. Uh, so it's a pretty spectacular wine on its own. But as an ice cream, I don't know, there's just something magical about it. We make affogados out of it, so we use the ice cream with coffee. Uh, and a lot of people use it for cocktails, like Manhattans and Negronis. And Sounds good to me. Good, <laughs> all good. So tell me, uh, tell me about Marjoram Wines. Where did you come from? How'd you get here? So forth, so on. Well, I started out uh, in Santa Barbara as a restaurateur. I had a restaurant called The Wine Cask, and I had a wine shop, and we had a catering business. Uh, it's a really tiny little spot up in El Paseo. The place sort of kept growing, uh, but the first guys I met when I opened that, that place were Jim Clendenin of Au Bon Climat, who's recently passed, sadly, and then Bob Ladequist of Coupe. Okay. And we became Insta friends. We traveled all over Europe all, all the time together, and we did wine tasting together, and we hung out and did all sorts of stuff together. And um, then, and in 1986, we decided to start making wine together. And then um, I decided to devote full time uh, to winemaking and sold the restaurant in, um, in 2007, starting Marjor Wine Company in 2001. Do you ever go back over there and do tastings and things like that? Oh yeah, uh, we sit down and have lunch every single day with the entire team. Uh, and it's always great food. We almost always have wine at lunch. And so we serve lunch at my winery every day. And I pop up there and join them and they pop down and see me and join me for lunch and uh, we've remained great friends. Almost everything about winemaking I learned from Jim. What'd you just pour me? So this is Riviera Rosé, new vintage, 2022, just released. It's Grenache Rosé, uh, very dry, crisp, light, Provencal style rosé. Um, it's our largest production wine. Um, it is, I just can't keep it in stock. Even in, in, in uh, we bottled it in January. Uh, in February, we had, our depletions were just off the charts. A, a month that rosé should not be selling in. It doesn't, does it with this weather, but not with the weather we're having. And right. I, I actually called my Chicago distributor and said, hey, you haven't ordered any rosé. He goes, it's 12 below back here. I'm like, oh yeah, I forget. <laughs> so cheers. Cheers. You know why you cheers, right? It's the, it, you, you get every single sense in wine except for hearing. And so you got, you got, you have visual, you have smell, you have taste, you have texture. Uh, sometimes with a sparkling one, you can hear it, but this definitely guarantees every sense is covered when you do the ching. So wait, that was a wine tip. 
for those of you who know. (laughs) (laughs) And you know why they call it a toast, right? A toast? A toast? Because in the olden days when wine was not good, in order to make wine even palatable, you would take burnt bread and it essentially became a charcoal filter and you would put the wine through the through the bread uh, to filter out all the impurities and that's you you drink it over there so it's, that's why they call it a toast i never knew that and then in, usually in old and you know now we trust each other but in other times you when you toasted you put you spilled wine into each other's glasses so that you weren't poisoning the other person right that i knew <laughs> that i knew <laughs> This stuff smells great. Oh my gosh. It is. It is never, ever this good out of the gate. It's almost always better, you know, three to six months of aging. But in 2022, we had that sort of ridiculously hot uh, Labor Day weekend of 10 days of just unrelenting heat. But then after that, it turned into like one of the colder, longer harvests we've ever had. So it allowed the Grenache, the Grenache we picked for Rosé is relatively underripe because this is only a 9% alcohol, mm-hmm. but it allowed it to hang on the vine at flavor uh, and not get too ripe. Right. And so we're, so for the first time in my memory uh, that we've released a wine like, wow, it's jump, it has taste, it has smells, and it's, it's, gotten, it's got resolved because we were able to pick more physiologically ripe grapes than, than ever before just because of that weird ball vintage. I've gotten comments from my distributors like best ever, you know, best wine ever. This what about all this rain that we got? Well, how's so, that going to affect No, it? rain has been great. I mean, the, the vines are dormant, uh, so they're they're not doing anything. Uh, the soils need percolating and we need groundwater. Uh, vines need to have a certain amount, you know, if you have a shoot, you need to have a certain amount of a shoot length with chlorophyll to be able to ripen a cluster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, in these last year, you know, some of the some of the vines were suffering so bad, you'd get a shoot that was only about this tall, and it's it just um, just doesn't work. And so the vines are going to grow so so tall that we'll go in and chop them back to four or five feet because you know if you get too much vigor, then all they're doing is growing and they're forgetting about that little cluster of grapes down right, there. But right, if you right. take it off, then they go, oh, okay, we better get that like those grapes right. So we'll have to do a lot of hedge pruning, and we actually even didn't plant as as a, uh, as much of a cover crop uh, as we normally do, which puts nutrients back into the soil because there's. There's so much nutrient in the soil right now with all this water. Right, right. Uh, so the rains, rains have been very, very good. So you like this? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it as I'm tired. I, I want, I want it to stop. Uh, there's artisanal wells that are pouring out of the ground up in the San Ynez Valley. Really? You can just be walking along, and there'll be just water just bubbling out of the ground. Wow, it's amazing. And it's not over yet. It's They're talking El Nino out there. That means it's yeah. gonna go all through spring. So yeah. I want it to stop. <laughs> <laughs> You know. Said like a true Californian. Yeah. We have enough. <laughs> so it's mostly Grenache. Um, you know, there's two ways to make Grenache rosé. You could press it, which is where you take the red grapes and just press it. You get pink wine. Uh, but you could also do Signe, right. where you're making red wine and you siphon out some of the juice. So this is 85% press and 15% Signe. Yeah, I'll tell you, everyone I've, I have given this wine to to try just loves it. And the people that were here... Uh, on the wine tour, uh, they all walked home with this. A couple of them joined memberships. They, they were really impressed. Oh, good! I didn't hear that. That's great. Um, yeah, so that's the that's sort of our flagship wine these days. It's amazing. I hope we can make it to the next bottling. So. Right, right, right. Ready it's for good the wine? Script, though. Yeah. I'm ready. Okay. Oh, I got the wrong. This is a different wine. Let me uh, grab the right wine. So you can help on. We gotta go get the right stuff. Okay, here's the right one. Hope your editing skills are good. <laughs> <laughs> we just had an incident. <laughs> okay, so here we go. This is an M5 white, which is truly five white grapes. Uh, it's all from the estate, and it's Grenache Blanc, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, and Picpoul Blanc. Okay, and you see estate, so everything's grown right there on the property. On the property, organically grown. Uh, we, we farm it and up in San Ynez. San Ynez on uh, El Malpitado Road, right between Ballard and Los Olivos. Smells great. Yeah, this has been the most accoladed and 
You know, it's it's not a category that you would think would be easy to sell because you don't. I, I tell retailers, like, when's the last time someone came in and asked for a California Roan White blend? Right. And they say never. Right. Uh, but when we get this uh, in the glass and get it on by the glass list, or people come in here and taste it, they flip over it because. Well, the thing is, is like it's very interesting. One thing we were talking about when we were here um, before is that I told them about the white blend, and they're all looking at me like I'm crazy. What do you mean a white blend? You know, it's just not something that they're used to to hearing. People right. aren't used to hearing it. But this is a, it's, it's interesting because I've been making the M5 red blend for many, many years, but white Roan varietals had, were never very appealing to me. Uh, but then uh, I got a consulting gig in France with Philippe Gombe, um, who was a legendary consultant in the south of France, and they had Viognier and Rousson, and the wines they were making they were not happy with. Viognier and Rousson are the most like fruit forward and clumsy grapes that exist on the planet, right. especially in the Rhone Valley. You know, we tasted wines from other winemakers, we bought wines, and then we decided to plant Marsan and Grenache Blanc. What, what I got out of it was how incredible pick pool was. When it came time to plant and decide what to plant in my own vineyard, I really wanted pick pool. I tend to like wines with a little bit more acidity and have a little more longevity to them and, uh, and go with food. And I want, you know, my whole, my whole benchmark of high quality is savory. If you taste the wine and you want to eat something, that is that is the check mark that I, I want desire most for wines to have. So the Grenache Blanc, is that a different varietal than Grenache? Yeah. Okay. So it's like Pinot Noir, right. and Pinot Blanc, right. and Pinot Gris. And they're all clonal mutations of red, white, and gray. Right. Um, but they're very different grapes. Obviously, one's white, one's red, one's gray. Right, right. Um, and, um, but I've always liked Grenache Blanc. So this is primarily, the, the M5 white blend is primarily Grenache Blanc. And then it's blended with sort of equal parts of Viognier and Rousson, and then a little bit less Marsan, and then just a touch of the Pickpool. Pickpool translates literally to lip smacker. Uh, it's a very, very acidic, very tight, lean grape. And it's, it represents 4% of the blend and 5% uh, would be too much. Right, right. It's just sort of that, that's, that, it's that impactful. People are gonna come out with pick pool by itself? We do a varietal pick pool. Oh. It sells out almost immediately. We're, we, we're sold out of 21. We're just getting ready to bottle 22 uh, next week. It's for people who really are serious wine drinkers who really want something acidic. And so I, I, like, I like good acidity. I, I'm interested to try it. I would like to see because I, I never, I mean, that's to me, that's a new varietal. I, I mean, I know it's been around, but for me personally, so I'd like to try it just we by itself. A, we have an acre and a half. Um, and so we're able to use some for the blend and also make some varietal. Right, right. When we prune, there's no sticks left on the ground because people come and take the sticks to plant in their vineyard. You know, grapes are like weeds. Right. You can grab a stick, and if you put it the right side up, you can stick it in the ground and it'll grow. It'll grow. It's kind of amazing. That's great. Yeah. Why are there so many wineries out here? <laughs> well, and, and it's, it's, grapes are, you know, if we have water, they are, they grow very prolifically. Yeah, but then there's the science behind it. Just... Well, there's the balance of it. You yeah, know, the yeah. thing is you, you, know, you need to balance the crop with the climate you're in, with the varietal that you're working with. And, you know, every vineyard we work with was, is in a different microclimate with a different varietal or a different clone. And so it's, you know, if you see our harvest plan, we probably have 200 separate picks that we're doing that have to be calculated as to exactly when we want to pick that fruit and what the strategy is behind what we're trying to achieve from that fruit. And it's a, it's a, it's a maze. It's a... And you keep saying we, so is that your team? Yeah, it's our team. Are you the primary winemaker? I am not. Okay. Uh, so we've just recently had a winemaker change in January of this year. Uh, we hired a new winemaker. He's brought incredible perspective to the team. It's uh, it's so funny because it's, it's really healthy, actually. New energy and new ideas. And, and he's just brilliant. He's really, really smart. That's and, great. Uh, he understands the, the technical aspects and the, the science and the chemistry right. way more than I do. But uh, the regimen and how I want the wines made are what I need to communicate to him. Sure. So we are figuring we're gonna need about a year to two years to mind meld 
we can't just do the Spock thing. Why not? Well, I wish we could. <laughs> I really wish we could, but it's gonna take a couple years. You know, he'll say something to me and I'm like, no, we don't do it that way here. And then I'll explain why and he'll go, oh, that's that's smart. Right, right. So it's been, you know, we're still in the honeymoon phase, right. uh, but it's really been, um, it's really been great having him on board and, and it's kind of exciting too. Yeah, and the winery oh, just looks great. And he's a, he's a great personality, and he's just a he, he's just brought a whole new energy to the to the program. So we're, I'm I'm thrilled to have him on board. But my official title is director of winemaking. I mean, that's just sort of a, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm still the yeah. winemaker, <laughs> but, but I'm not. I just don't have enough time to do that. I have I do I do all the other things that are required when you own a business. So right, so. right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So this is tasty, huh? I like it. I actually finished it. <laughs> Extremely proud of this wine. We've already done the 2022 blend, and um, it's going to be even better. 2022 is just turning out to be a great vintage. And then this is the 2021 M5 Red. That's hard to remember, too. Ah, I take the lid off before I take pour it. Take the lid off, right? Yeah. You are the winemaker, right? God, you think. <laughs> You're making a mess. I'm making a huge mess. <laughs> luckily, luckily, we have napkins. They invented these things <laughs> where you can clean things up like this. M5 Red was the wine I literally set out to make. My light bulb wine, and you know what I mean by light bulb wine? Uh huh. So, and everyone's had one. It's that wine that you had, all of a sudden you went, wait a minute, wine is important. I want to, I want to, uh, this is, this is magical. I want to know more. With the lightning strike. Yeah. And right. it's, it, everyone knows it, that, you know, it's that time. So mine was Chateau Neuf de Pop mm -hmm. and I was 14 years old. And really? Yep, 14 years old. My parents took me to Chateau Neuf de Pop and the guy was taking the wine out of the pipette, giving it to me in the Tastevin and I'm drinking these wines. I'd never really had alcohol. And uh, all of a sudden, I liked my parents. Uh, I, liked, I, liked, I liked this wine. They liked me. And uh, it was just, it was really a, a neat, neat experience. And the guy was explaining how wine was made. I was i was blown away. And I was just, you know, that guy, that kid. The test and, kid. Uh, yep. And so I always started, I started thinking about wine. I worked at restaurants in high school and college. and. Uh, I was always the guy who knew a little bit more about wine. So this is the wine. I mean, this is our flagship wine. This is, I call this my desert island wine because this would be the wine that I would live with the rest of my life if I had to choose one wine. Because every time I taste it, it, it brings me something new or some nuances change because it ages and it's just... Um, what are the varietals in here? M5 is uh, Grenache, again, Grenache base, blended with Syrah, Morved, Cunoise, and Cinso. So it's GSM kind of hyper GM, GSM. GSM CC. And there's a little bit of V in there oh. because when we planted the estate vineyard, we co-planted three of the blocks of the estate vineyard with Viognier, but we're not changing it to M6 because right, we, right. we have M5 trademarked. And, uh, <laughs> but there is six. there are six varietals in here. There's about a percent of Viognier in this wine. It's like, it's like a GSM on steroids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, this is cold climate here. We're, we're dealing we're dealing with different, the, the expressions of Syrah and Grenache are much different in cold climate than they are in warmer climate. And so we're getting, um, you get sort of these sort of really pretty red fruits and lots of spice. Uh, I get a lot of sort of watermelon and licorice and cola and root beer and, and beef What's jerky. What's funny is, is that, that when you smell this wine, you get, um, it, it seems like it's a really bold wine. Yeah. And then you taste it, you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. It's very smooth, very smooth. Very smooth, very bright. Once again, my key is it's savory. Right. And the way we keep it savory is by leaving it on the lees, letting it, letting it get reductive in the winemaking. Okay, now tell, tell everybody what the lees is. So for red wine, you take the red grapes, you crush them, you put them in a fermenter, and then you have to continually mix it up to get the extraction from this, you know, the, the pulp is white, and then you get the color and the tannin and the flavors from the skins and the seeds and from the stems. And so we're always punching those down back into the, into the wine to get extraction. When the wine's just about finished fermentation, we, we press slightly sweet. And so then we press right into barrel and then we let the primary fermentation finish in barrel. So the primary fermentation is still creating CO2. And so we keep that CO2 in the wine. So we slam a bung in there. And instead of the lees all falling down at the bottom, they stay suspended in the wine. Right, right. So lees are a natural antioxidant. 
CO2 is a natural antioxidant, so we use very, very little sulfur in the winemaking process. Plus, we keep the winery at 55 degrees or colder 24 seven. Right. And so that means the wines stay in barrel, they just don't move, they don't lose their CO2. And then right before we bottle, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll rack off the, off the mud, the, the lees, and we'll also uh, take some of the CO2 out of the wine. I just like that because, you know, I, there's been many people that I've talked to who love wine and can't drink wine mm -hmm. because of the additives that put into so much wine. And I keep trying to tell them that that's not the case in, in every winery. The, the biggest carcinogen in wine by a factor of 100 is alcohol. Right. Alcohol is the poison in wine. Right. All the other stuff, sulfur, you know, the levels we're using it is undetectable, and ours is even a quarter of what most wineries are. So just because I don't think sulfur is actually a long-term antioxidant. Yesterday, I had my bankers there, and I had opened a wine, and I had about that much wine out of it, and I put it up on a shelf in the winery, and they were there yesterday, and I said, would you like to taste in something that's been open 24 days? And they're like, no, no. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I would have said, I'm not kidding. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, my wines can be open and, and stay good even without sulfur. Wow. And uh, so took the bottle out, poured it around, and everyone was just, just stunned. The wine had no degradation whatsoever. And it was just fresh and bright and they were taking seconds and drinking it. And it was just, it was great because it was almost like it had been aged for 20 years. If you buy a bottle of that wine and you can open it and you have a cool place to store it where it doesn't get moved a lot, right. uh, it'll, three weeks, no problem. Huh. I've never heard that one before. No. That's great. Okay, cool. So, um, very interesting story here at Marjoram Wines. Again, we're sitting in with Doug Marjoram in the funk zone. Oh, while I'm thinking about it, would you like to plug anything? Anything coming up? Something um, new? No, if you haven't been to the tasting room, it's a really neat experience. Yeah. Um, it's, we're one block from the beach. Uh, we have a full menu. So you can not only taste here, but you can have a little meal. Beautiful outside seating and- uh, And ice cream. And ice cream. And ice cream. That's a, yeah, that's a, it's a fun place to visit. I think it's a good place if you want to learn about Marjoram and Barden Wines. You know, our staff is incredible. Nothing they don't know. Okay, Barden Wines. You said Barden Wines. What is Barden Wines that I noticed on my hat back here? It says Barden. So Barden is my middle name. Uh, and anything from the Santa Rita Hills, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir especially, we put under the Barden etiquette. Marjoram is mostly Rhone varietals. Right. And then we make a ton of Sauvignon Blanc. And then Barden is uh, anything from Santa Rita Hills. And that's that's the demarcation. The Barden wines are are quite a bit more expensive than the Marjoram wines, just because of the nature of that of that land and that uh, that place. Right. It's a tough tough place to grow high quality grapes. Right. Right. Uh, and so they are expensive. So um, this place is really cool. Thanks. It really is. I it's enjoy a nice it. space. It's a nice space. It's beautiful. You can come here on a tour. You can come here on the weekend, hang out outside on the patio. It's definitely a beautiful space. We use these old barrels that we had around for both the bar and the, and the space. And then we have the mezzanine for large groups. So if you have a group of 12, and because there's very few places, few places you can go in the funk zone if you have more than six people, right. that you can actually find a place to taste. And so we have the space upstairs, which works out great for that. Well, I think I'm going to go take a look at the rest of your facility. Yeah, you guys are you're going to run up to the winery. You're going to run up to the winery. And yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Great hanging out with you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> this is the Wine Dude here at Marjoram Wines. <laughs>